committee, the local organizing committee, for giving me the opportunity to discuss both of these wonderfully presented abstracts. I entitled my presentation as follows, Me to EGFR TKIs, Should We Now Demand a Higher Standard? Now let's Next. recall that the trial that led to the approval of erlotinib as second or third line therapy is this one from Francis Shepard, NCI Canada, BR21, which showed an overall survival benefit for erlotinib in all comers. But this benefit was fairly modest. I think we all recognize that. A similar study Thanks. with Defitinib, which was conducted during the time when EGFR mutation status in tumors was still a glimmer in somebody's eye, uh, was actually negative. As you all recall, this disappointing trial called ICEL showed no improvement in overall survival in the same setting, second and third line, platinum pretreated patients. So this leads us to the Me Too or in-class drug concept. You know, this is a very common drug development strategy, particularly for pharmaceutical companies. It's widely used in various non-cancer settings. For example, some of you probably have high blood pressure. You have a bunch of angi angiotens angiotensin inhibitors. If you have high cholesterol, there are about seven to nine statins out there. If you're depressed, serotonin and uh, reuptake inhibitors are, uh, are a bunch. And present company excluded, phosphodiesterase inhibitors such as Cialis and Viagra populate our pharmacies. But this concept is also seen in oncology. You see the taxanes. Uh, uh, we, we use uh, paclitaxel and docetaxel very frequently. NAB paclitaxel is in there. VEGFR TKIs, particularly in renal cell carcinoma, are a dime a dozen. They're serafinib, sunitinib, bazopinib, and all of the other NIBs. And mTOR inhibitors, they're all rapamycin, but we have temsorolimus and everolimus, which are in, in the market. And today, we'll look at the EGFR TKIs. Thanks. Now, this was a, an interesting slide that I uh, cut and paste out of a study done by the uh, McKinsey Group, showing that the majority of new drug launches over a certain time period had similar mechanisms of action to already pre-existing drugs. You can see from this slide that uh, these accounted for 66 of the top 76 drugs launched between 2003 and 2006. And it's astounding to me, this is non-oncology, that nearly 85% of new drug launch sales were due to Me Too drugs, not new agents. So why should Thanks. we go this route? Why should we develop Me Too or in-class drugs? Well, it gives us a chance to optimize the drug class, right? You could increase the potency of the drug. You could perhaps improve its formulation and perhaps by doing so enhance drug delivery. You could enhance the efficacy and tolerability of your drug class. Thanks. It can also potentially lower drug costs. If you have a true free market, assuming you do have such a thing, more competing choices should lower or exert pressure on drug prices. But then why should Next. we not go this route? What are the disadvantages of Me Too drug development? Well, in kidney cancer, for example, more choices actually leads to more confusion. In clinic, what do you use first? Drug A, drug B, or drug C? I think the most important or critical issue here is that this approach diverts our precious resources away from the many other unmet needs. Me Too drugs target the market for which an indicated agent already exists, and therefore other indications uh, and the research into those indications may be compromised. Thanks. And this is the most unfortunate thing, even though you think that more choices will lead to lower costs, it actually doesn't. Drug costs usually remain high. The sponsor will try to recoup its development costs when the drug, the new drug, or the Me Too drug is launched, and there's very little cost effectiveness subsequently. And even for a frontline drug like erlotinib, uh, the BR21 investigators published this paper in the JNCI uh, last year. They analyzed the cost effective effectiveness of erlotinib based on the BR21 data, and they calculated about 
$95,000 per year of life gained. And look at this 95% confidence interval. The upper limit is up to $429,000. The conclusions of the BR21 investigators was that erlotinib is only marginally cost-effective. These are their words, not mine. And they, uh, of course, said that the use of molecular predictors of benefit for targeted agents may help identify most more cost-effective subgroups for treatment. So I guess what we should be thinking about is that uh, should these Me Too drugs be held to a higher standard, for example, for regulatory approval? And the principal criteria are what I list here. Number one, they should be better in terms of efficacy. Number two, they could either be safer or more tolerable. The third is, are they more convenient to administer in the clinic? And of course, the fourth is, are they more cost effective and more affordable? And maybe we should be asking ourselves, what kind of formula should we be applying? Should at least two of these, these criteria be met for regulatory approval? Maybe one should be overwhelmingly positive so the Next. EGFR TKIs represent a Me Too story. Shown here are three approved agents. Uh, one of them have, has sort of uh, not uh, gone the way of full approval in the United States. These are the EGFR TKIs, Jafitnib, Erlotinib, and Lapatinib. Lapatinib is not approved for lung cancer, but it is available. These are all orally bioavailable kinozoline derivatives. And today we heard about Next. two others, Icotinib and PF299, which I googled and found out that it's also called dacomitinib. Uh, but you can see that these are all based on the same quinozoline structure. So they're Me Too drugs. So what we'll do Thanks. today is try to fill out this report card. This is my Me Too report card, where we ask the question, is the new drug more efficacious, safer, more convenient, and perhaps someday be less costly or more cost effective? Thanks. We heard Dr. Sun present the Icogen trial, one-to-one -one randomization, non-inferiority design. Uh, he didn't show you the uh, uh, non-inferiority margin, but I show you here uh, what the statistical design of that trial uh, was at the bottom of this slide. The primary endpoint was PFS. And we all uh, saw the, that the response uh, and disease control rates were similar across both groups of Icotinib and Jafitinib treated patients and that the primary endpoint showed uh, non-inferiority for progression-free survival. Uh, there appeared to be a trend in favor of Icotinib here, but remember, this is a non-inferiority design. And uh, the secondary analysis for overall survival showed no difference between the two TKIs. And Dr. Sun uh, showed that there were some modest improvements in terms of safety uh, with regards to uh, skin rash and diarrhea in this particular comparison. So what are my comments about this, uh, this particular phase three trial? Well, I'd like just to remind everyone that non-inferiority is never, never a substitute for a superiority trial. Uh, non-inferiority trials actually rely, rely heavily on issues that are unrelated to the hypothesis, for example, your quality control procedures as the trial is being conducted. And in fact, if you do an intent to treat approach with a non-inferiority trial, that biases that study towards equivalence. So you have to do per protocol analyses as well when you're doing non-inferiority trials. Uh, this does not apply to the Icogen trial, but a lack of protection from bias will sometimes occur because of lack of blinding. Fortunately, the Icogen trial was double blinded. And of course, there are the vexing issues about specifying the non-inferiority margin. Where do you place it? because that will determine your sample size. Again, PFS is a tricky endpoint. It's very sensitive to the timing and quality of the disease assessments. So uh, I didn't hear it from the presenters, but you need very tight central imaging review for a PFS endpoint. And then finally, Icotinib efficacy appeared to have similar efficacy to Jafitinib with slightly improved tolerability, but this is counterbalanced by the fact that it's given three times a day which I think will impact a little bit in the clinical setting when you're giving patients a TID drug versus a QD drug. So let's yes. fill out the report card. And is it more efficacious? Well, no, it was non-inferior, but it's not more efficacious than the existing TKI. Is it safer? Yeah, modestly so though, but it is a little safer. 
Is it more convenient? Well, the answer there is no. There are some compromises you'll have to take with adherence with a TID drug, and whether it will be less costly when it's released, God only knows. How about the PF299 compound? We heard Dr. Boyer eloquently present the results of a phase two randomized study comparing this uh, a pan herb inhibitor to erlotinib. Uh, Dr. Uh, Boyer showed uh, a benefit, although very modest, in favor of PF299 for all comers, shown here, uh, 12 weeks versus 8 weeks with a delta of about 4 weeks. And overall survival showed uh, a very modest trend in favor of PF299 uh, over erlotinib for overall survival. Thanks. And I, I guess we all heard that toxicity was a little bit more pronounced with PF299, particularly for the most uh, pressing ones that our patients experience diarrhea and skin slash mucosal toxicity. So Thanks. what are my comments about this trial? Well, it was uh, obviously a well-conducted randomized phase two. There were, were some imbalances in the baseline characteristics, notably the uh, EGFR mutation status. There were modest improvements in PFS and a trend for improved OS, but uh, again, we need to go back to Earth here. The median PFS advantage was just four weeks, which is less than one imaging uh, interval, uh, so the patients clearly progressed after that last assessment. Toxicity here is a concern, particularly for a drug that you'll have to take for a long time. Uh, chronic exposure uh, with these compounds and adherence to the drug will suffer because of chronic irritative toxicities. And we were already told that the ARCHER trial has been initiated. This is a confirmatory phase three, but we need to stop again a little here and uh, ask ourselves, was the efficacy signal seen with the phase two trial that was presented to us enough to commit resources to another phase three trial, one that will definitely cost us more than $10 million to run? Well, Thanks. this is the first line uh, non-small cell lung cancer experience where uh, there's a clear disconnect between phase two results and subsequent phase three results. And I highlight here in red all of those trials where a positive phase two led to a negative phase three, which is a drain on our very precious resources. And I'm guilty here because I was the uh, uh, in PI for one of these trials which uh, ended up to be a uh, negative phase three. So I'm very sensitive myself to the uh, resources that we, ex we expend in running very expensive phase three trials. Thanks. So what's the Me Too report card for Dacomit Dacomitinib or PF299? The caveat here, of course, is this is a phase two trial and not yet a phase three. So is it more efficacious? The answer, I guess, is yes, but it was a very modest benefit seen in this randomized phase two. Has it shown improved safety? Well, I think the answer there is definitely no. Uh, it was a, a bit more toxic, uh, notably so in terms of diarrhea and soft tissue and skin toxicity. Is more convenient? Well, no, it's uh, just like Erlotinib, it's a once a day drug. It wasn't any more convenient uh, than the comparator. And will it be less costly? And I, uh, I don't know about that, but I'm willing to bet that when it does, if it does ever meet its uh, phase three endpoint, that it may not be more uh, or, or will not be less costly than the existing agents. Just speaking from experience with uh, what we've seen with renal cell car carcinoma. So my Thanks. conclusions here are that Me Too drug development permeates our world, our, our oncologic drug development world. And uh, so far, what we've seen is that these Me Too drugs are only modestly better if at all, than our existing agents. So our debate, the debate that we need to have honestly with ourselves is that should higher standards for, say, regulatory approval be imposed on Me Too drugs? So I think the final word here is that Me Too drug development must never ever distract, distract us from the many unmet needs in this particular context. For example, overcoming resistance, to EGFR TKIs, we need to find that inhibitor to the T790M mutant. Uh, we need to optimize therapy for those patients with wild type tumors for which we only have chemotherapy and perhaps bevacizumab. KRAS mutated tumors are another unmet need among others. So I, I hope uh, we can have a friendly debate amongst ourselves 
and be better drug developers in the future. So I thank you for your attention.